First up, in a recent interview with Gamus Utra, co-founder of Media Molecule, Alex Evans stated that he and his team were bouncing around ideas recently, and he can't say what it is yet, but the team's next project will be, quote, really effing cool. According to the ESRB, the second downloadable Watchmen game, Watchmen The End Is Nigh 2, will feature the two heroes Night Owl and Warshock hunting down the molester of a porn star. The game is currently slated for release alongside the Watchmen movies release on DVD and Blu-ray. Capcom has announced that downloadable competitive multiplayer will be releasing for Resident Evil 5 in the coming weeks. It will include a deathmatch, a team deathmatch, and a mode where players compete to see who can kill the most infected. The pack will cost $4.99 on the PlayStation Store and 400 Microsoft points on Xbox Live. According to G4, Bioshock 2 and the second batch of Grand Theft Auto 4 DLC both have release windows of November 2009, assuming no delays come up. And finally, a new expansion is coming soon to Criterion's open world action racing game Burnout Paradise. The expansion will feature a new area called Big Surf Island and appears to be also featuring buggy cars. Bungie Studios, the creators of the legendary Halo franchise, just won't quit. They've recently released their third map pack for Halo 3, the Mythic Map Pack. You can get this map pack by buying the limited edition of Halo Wars, or you can wait a month or two for it to come out as a standalone purchase on Xbox Live. Does it stand up to their other two? Well, here's my review. I have to admit, I haven't reviewed a map pack before, but I'm sure that a good place to start is to review a map pack for my favorite online shooter, Halo 3. I got my hands on Halo Wars Limited Edition so I could go for a romp in three new arenas, Orbital, Sandbox, and Assembly. Orbital is one of the few human maps in the game. Most of the other ones are either Covenant or Forerunner, but this one is set at the top of a global space elevator hovering around Earth. It features two horseshoes that overlap each other. The map can take quite a while to wrap your head around, but once you notice that you can see the enemy base through a window from your base, it makes perfect sense. On some game types, there's a large blast door that's openable from the base side in front of one entrance on each base. Weirdly enough, this door is easily worked around as an open entrance is just on the other side of a wall with a passage through it. Each base also has a small hard to notice passage leading from the outside to the top floor. The halls are littered with stacks of boxes to use as cover, but they're still wide enough to drive a mongoose through. There is also a pit of death at the center of the map with a lower and higher balcony on either side. You can jump from the higher one to the lower one if you aim right, but if you don't know how, then you'll find yourself falling to your death every time you try. I find the best game types to play on this map are Capture the Flag and SWAT, or a combination of the two. SWAT is a game type that gives players extra damage resistance but makes them susceptible to headshots. Usually it's not my favorite game type, in fact it's probably one of my least favorite game types, but with the long hallways and abundant sources of cover, SWAT on Orbital becomes a must play. Our second map of the pack is Sandbox. In the first map pack titled Heroic, a map was released that could have every object inside of it deleted in Forge in order to create a blank slate for aspiring map designers. It was a fine concept, but was weighed down by weird ceiling formations and not a lot of room. Sandbox is an improvement on the idea of a forger's paradise. It is massive and offers limitless possibilities with a huge budget for building. But before we talk about that, let's talk about the default layout, the one that Bungie has set up. The map is probably one of the more open maps in the game. It has obviously been designed for team game types such as Capture the Flag or Assault. Unfortunately, all the vehicles such as Warthogs and Choppers are rendered next to useless due to the fact that there are two rocket launchers on the map. In short, the map is a bit too open for an on-foot approach and a bit too explosive for a vehicular attack, leaving just the one option. Quit in frustration. Fortunately, go into the map in Forge mode and you'll find yourself with thousands more possibilities. Beyond having the entire original map to canvas and make your own maps in, there is also a Sky Bubble, which is a platform up high in the map. You can set objects on top of this platform, but you can't stand on it. Fall through it and you die. 
drop vehicles through it, and they explode when they hit the ground. The only way the top layer can affect a lower layer is by shooting down through it. For those who prefer the confined pre-built walls of foundry, there's another large room down below, exactly the same size as the open portion of foundry. So not only does Sandbox include a large open arena, a platform in the sky, but it also basically includes foundry down below, making this the single largest map of Halo 3. The third and final map of Mythic is Assembly, and it's a map that many players have been waiting for for a while. A good, solid, small arena map for a low player count. That's exactly what this is. The main issue with this map is that the matchmaking playlist designed for the Mythic map pack only is that it keeps putting 8 player team matches on it. That is way too many people. This is a fine map, but only when played on game types such as Slayer and Juggernaut, with, and with no more than 5 or 6 players. Each side has a building with one way glass, so people inside can see out, but those come in can't see how the enemy is making preparations for their arrival. The middle has a tube shaped shield door which houses the active camo. The Mythic map pack is a fine addition to the already lengthy list of Halo 3 maps. Sandbox follows the founder tradition of disappointing default layout, assembly is fun but only under limited conditions, and orbital is an excellent linear map that actually makes SWAT fun. The Mythic map pack gets a B+. As promised, I'm not just bashing the Wii. I'm gonna bash all of them. This is the second in my series of top fives going over what the systems need to stop doing. This week, it's Microsoft and the Xbox 360, starting with number five. Battery-operated controllers. People hate batteries. You're constantly running out of juice and going out and buying new ones. The Xbox 360's controller runs on two double A's. Double A's that run out in a paltry six or seven hours. You, yeah, I know, you can buy battery packs and recharger kits, but once you add up the cost for those for several controllers, it can get pretty expensive. Look at the PS3. All of its controllers work on a battery that can be recharged by plugging it into the system or any computer with a USB port. Number four, kill the avatars. Seriously, these guys are annoying, and you can't turn them off. They force even the most serious gamer to look like some sort of cartoon cross between home characters and me's. I hate putting up with all of them waving at me every time I want to scroll through my friends list to see who's in what party. Number three. This one is the most obvious problem. The Red Ring of Death. Many people claim that this problem has gone away, but it doesn't. It still happens. Seriously, Microsoft, you've had enough time to deal with this problem. So get off your thrones made of money and deal with it already. Number two, party system dropouts. It's been several months since the release of the disappointing NXC update and this problem still persists. You may be in the middle of an intense game of Call of Duty 4 with some friends in a party and suddenly you're kicked out for no apparent reason. The game is a bit too fast moving to take the time to navigate the painfully long loading times of the guide to rejoin your party. So you can either wait out the rest of the game in silence, not communicating, or you can die several times while rejoining the party. And number one, intercontinental server issues. This is a problem that many people won't notice, but I do. I've got many very good friends on Xbox Live. Friends I wouldn't actually mind meeting in real life. Unfortunately, most of these friends are thousands of miles away in Canada, or worse, across the Atlantic. And having friends who are playing in Europe will quickly clue you into this problem as they're constantly complaining about it, and rightly so. It's called latency. Many games, such as Halo 3, only have servers for their games in North America, which means that European gamers have to have their signals sent across the Atlantic. Now, I know, electrical signals do travel very fast, but when it's that far, there is a little bit of slowdown. A European gamer may fire his gun, and a second later, his gun fires. That may not seem like a lot, but when you're playing a fast-paced game like Halo that requires precision accuracy, that second is all the enemy needs to have a huge advantage over you. So Microsoft seriously needs to put more servers overseas so that we can kick our European friends' asses on an even playing field.